remember throughout my life, like going up through a ceiling and getting halfway through and looking around and seeing the insulation and, and seeing things in the attic. And I remember going through a window or, or through a door. And as I got older, I was told that human beings could not do things like this. So it was very confusing, the grays. All they do is the legwork for the interdimensionals and the uh, other extraterrestrials. They were genetically designed by the tall grays and the interdimensionals. I sometimes refer to her as an extraterrestrial mom because I do know that she is a guardian and she escorts me everywhere I go. Welcome everyone to Cosmic Convergence, where we delve into the fascinating world of extraterrestrial intelligence, consciousness, and the mysteries of the universe. My name is Daniel, and I am joined with my co-hosts, John, Christian, and George. Today we have a special guest, Nancy Thames. And Nancy, you're a former DOD employee, a lifelong contactee of extraterrestrial beings. She's also a leading voice in alien disclosure, spiritual awakening, and her journey marked by personal struggles transformed profoundly through continuous extraterrestrial encounters. Initially suppressed, those experiences were eventually embraced as Nancy began to understand her purpose for her life and humanity. Driven by her lifelong contact, Nancy founded timefordisclosure.com, advocating for the open dialogue on extraterrestrial interactions and their implications for humanity. Through the platform, she shares personal encounters, insights from beings across dimensions and her perspective on human evolution. Her philosophy of unity, spiritual evolution, and truth drives her writing and community engagement, inviting humanity to embrace our place within the larger galactic framework. Nancy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I'm very proud to be here. And thank you for having me on here to um, share my experiences. My name is Nancy Thames. It's like the Thames, it's pronounced like the Thames River in England. And for me, this has been happening all my life. And my first conscious memory started around two to three years old. Um, and when I was that young, I was not scared. So they would come and get me, and they would always send three hybrid grays. At the time, I had no clue what they were or, or anything about them. It was just something that I thought, I just thought it was something that everybody had happened. So the, the three would come. One was a female. They were reddish brown color, about four to five foot tall, and they would get me, and they would um, have me. As I was laying down, they would take a hand device and they would scan me from my heads to my toe, all the way back up, head to toe, toe to head, head to toe, toe to head. And eventually I would feel my little body start to float up off the bed. And as I would float up, I would look around and look down and my bed was empty and I would be holding the hands of the female gray. And I would ask her, what are we doing? And she, really didn't answer me a lot of times. So, but I remember throughout my life, like going up through a ceiling and getting halfway through and looking around and seeing the insulation and, and seeing things in the attic. And I remember going through a window or, or through a door. And as I got older, I was told that human beings could not do things like this. So it was very confusing for me, very confusing. Um, and I also found out that not only my family didn't want to talk about this kind of stuff, they thought it was just uh, a, like a, a very imaginative dream, uh, something like that. And they would tell me, go back to bed. You're just having a wild dream. So, you know, and then as I got older, I was in Girl Scouts and played in sports and all these things. And if we would be, if I would talk about it at breakfast, they would say, enough, shut up. You cannot talk about this to other people. They will put people in a mental institution for talking about these things. So you better quit talking about it. So I did, <laughs> you know, it brought peace to the family. And I realized, you know, that it's just not a topic. I grew up in the South. I grew up in Tennessee, live in Mississippi now. And this is the Bible Belt, and people don't like to talk about this kind of stuff. 
So I did suppress it. And it was very hard to carry this burden with me and not really have anyone to talk to about it because it was always continuing to happen, even if it, you would skip a month or whatever. And you would think, well, OK, I guess this is over with. That's not the case. It, wherever I moved to, wherever I was living, um, I've lived in Australia, it happened there. I've lived in Hawaii, it happened there. Alabama, it happened there. Georgia, it happened there. Tennessee, of course, and here in Mississippi. So it doesn't matter where you are. You can't run away from this. Um, you know, it, it, it's going to happen. Of course, I never understood it, and it was very hard for me. But um, as I got older, I started asking and demanding information as to why it was happening to me. What was the purpose? What does this mean? And um, what really put me to that point of demanding this information was when I was in my late 20s, I was on a vacation and I had two boys and they were small, small children. And they, I was in a Marriott Hotel at Key West. I and my ex-husband were in one bed and the boys were in the other. And I felt the presence of the grace. I have the ability, I know before they're coming, not like an hour or anything, but say five, 10 minutes, I'll know they're coming. So I raise up, three short grays appeared in the room. They were about three feet tall and they were not the ones that normally come for me. And so one of them approached me and he was wearing a very high collar and they were all wearing robes. And he took his hand and pushed me down on the left-hand side back down to the bed and telepathically told me, this is not about you. Lay down, go to sleep. And so I didn't have a choice. He pushed me back down and then he put me in a sleep paralysis. So I could not move and I could not speak. And I saw them walk over and get my two sons. And that was, I witnessed their first experiences that they were taking and I was very upset with this. And the next morning, because I did eventually go to sleep, and when I woke up, they were safe and sound in their bed. No harm had been done. And we went to breakfast, and I asked if they had anything they wanted to talk about or any strange dreams, and they said no. So they had no recollection of any of it. But that, when I got home is when I sit down, and I meditated and asked for face-to-face and I demanded to know answers. Why me? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to my children? What is the purpose and what does this mean? And they showed me a vision of myself before I became a human, went, in, went into a, a soul here, or my soul went into a body here. They showed me sitting and waiting and they said, it's time for you to go. And then they, I saw myself go in into a, a woman's belly. And I was in, in her, you know, went into the the womb, I guess. So I, I didn't really, I was in my 30s when they told me all this, and I didn't really understand it all. But, and I, you know, I really couldn't talk about it to anybody. And at that point, that's not, you didn't want to go talk to a, a, a therapist or anything like that because they would automatically think you were nuts. So I just suppressed it. And I was, able to do that. I can't say that, you know, I, I ended up, I was in two failed marriages and uh, was horrible, horrible divorces, you know, so I went through a lot of personal struggles and a lot of it is not to totally because of this, but it certainly did not help because when you have a spouse and they're not aware of what's happening to you because they put them in a sleep paralysis next to you, they think you're nuts. So, so anyway, so, but it, it, it's a very, it was a very hard thing to understand. So I'll stop and let y'all ask me some questions if you would like. You know, you being the Bible Belt, being in that arena, like I grew up Baptist as well. Like it's really hard to come to terms with any type of paranormal experiences you're happening because automatically the church or religious groups or your family that you're a part of, they're going to automatically assume whatever you're happening is demons. And I do have one kind of initial question, like when you're kind of going through that process, being younger and 
being in that with everything around you, you know, that did you feel like the interactions between these um, NHI, these, these entities where they were coming to you feel like, do you feel like they were somehow giving you something with each of these interactions or was it to prep you for something in the future? Can my, you go my into whole life, people? they were prepping me to mm -hmm. get me to where I am now. And even when I was little, I would see, uh, we would be riding, say, on a weekend. We would go out of town uh, on weekends uh, to go out to eat or whatever, to a movie, whatever. And I would see a craft following us, you know. So they all, always knew they were there. You know, they made a point to let me know that they were around, you know. Uh, so in... I've got a lot of reassurance from them that it takes time, you know, and they didn't ever pressure me. It was, I was never pressured and they made things fun. Well, when they sensed that I was like becoming afraid, what they would do is turn the experience into a very playful experience. They can change the scenery around you. They can change how you see them. So, if my mother had been reading me a bedtime story, they could, I would see that like the character of the book or in the scenery would be the character, you know, the landscape of the book I was reading. The, it didn't physically change, but that's what I, what I saw. And they pulled that from my mind because that was a safe, secure image and they could communicate with me and it could keep me at a comfort level you know, and it would calm me down. So they would go out of their way to make things as easy as possible because they understand that uh, it's very hard for humans. Uh, for me, it's not what they look like as much as the frequency exchange. Their frequency is so much higher than us that when you're face-to-face -face physically standing there holding hands with a extraterrestrial or interdimensional, it's an overwhelming feeling. And it's so different that in my mind is like, doesn't understand what this is, you know? So I can understand why most people totally flip out and, and freak out and, and jump straight to flight or fight because it's just like, when we were in our caveman days, everything around us around us was a predator. And when our brain sees something we just cannot comprehend, it automatically, you know, it puts up its guards and is like run or either you stand up and fight. So I've had to train myself now as I've gotten older, I've trained myself because I've realized that the longer that I stay conscious, I can have the full experience with them. But, and I also know, and I think that you'll hear other people tell you that when they're down here doing a, a task, for example, the grays, all they do is the legwork for the interdimensionals and the uh, other extraterrestrials. They were genetically designed by the tall grays and the interdimensionals to do legwork because the interdimensionals and extraterrestrials are comfortable with the density here on earth. So they designed these hybrids to do that leg work. So basically she comes down and gets me, gets me on craft and then I don't see her. And then that's when I'm around interdimensionals and the other extraterrestrials. And that would be like the interdimensionals are seven to eight foot tall, humanoid looking, but not human. Uh, the tall grays, I've seen some reptilians, there's some aquatic beings, and of course, like some Nordics or Palladians, I couldn't tell you which one they were, but they just like the blonde hair and stuff, and they're much taller than me. So, and then I don't see those hybrid grays until it's time to bring me back home. It's really, the way that they do things, there's, there's no way you can humanize anything about what happens there. Our physics does not apply to anything. Uh, there is no such thing as time. There is no such thing as money. So uh, technology, they are the technology. You know, they're, I'm sure they've traded some technology with us, but 
they don't need that. We would, you know, to be able to translate or something like that. But um, it's just that's the part that I get frustrated with is because it's hard for us to understand they are a billion years ahead of us in evolution. The way that we travel and do things, they are way past all that. That's uh, what you were describing falls along with what my research has shown me. So it is validating. Um, one of the things you had mentioned earlier was that uh, like prior to coming into like a human body, the soul being put in. In my research, I've come across near-death experiencers, out-of-body experiences, contactees, abductees, all kind of sharing the same information that these beings have the understanding of what a soul is and what happens when we die, physically leave the body. Um, so for the people that don't know, is there uh, more you can share with us about Absolutely. that aspect um, that they Absolutely. share with you? First of all, all extraterrestrials and interdimensionals have a soul and they are all biological. They are not robotic. They are not anything like that. Even the hybrid that comes from me is a biological being. They have souls and they believe in a creator source. They do not believe in our versions. They don't have different religions or, you know, like all of our right. man-made things, but they believe in a creator source and they believe we all have a soul. We are all in, we are energy beings. And when we take off our um, human costume, we are all alike. We are energy beings. And our soul and our consciousness is not in any of the organs of our body. It resides somewhere else. So when we cease to exist, our body dies, our soul and our consciousness goes up to source area and decisions are made on whether we have d done what we, our soul contract that we had designed right. before we got here. Everybody has kind of makes a decision about we are here on free will and we can decide how long we want to stay here, what we want to experience. So when we do die and we get there, uh, it's a review. And so when you go through the review and it's like when they took me before uh, the elders, they called them elders. So I'm sure it's the same thing. It's, it's a decision made at that point on whether you come back and, and experience more here on earth, or if that is, if you've done what you wanted to do and they're in agreement, you can choose to be an extraterrestrial. You could be a dolphin or, you, you know, you could really choose anything. And if you get to the point where you feel like, you just don't want to experience anything physical anymore. You can stay in a non-physical etheric state, hang around up in the highest dimension or the highest frequency close to creator source. And you can be there indefinitely. And there is no end in the universe and the galaxies go on and on and on and on. There's, there is no end. That's my understanding of it too. And, yes. that, and we're uh, immortal. We're immortal. But right. while we're in this human body and we've been programmed to think that we're supposed to die at a certain age and we've been dumbed down, but we can easily extend our lifespans and we have the capability of healing ourselves with the right frame of mind and, and get rid of some of this programming. Right. That, you know, from the minute we're born, we're given a social security number and we are programmed all through school and stuff to think a certain way. And it's not a good way for us to think. Yeah, this is real, that's not real. And um, I know exactly what you mean. And yes. I've some of the struggles I've had growing up too, like couldn't bring up certain things to some people. Thankfully, some of my family members were more open. So I had a space from time to time to share things. Yeah. And also that council of like elders that you referenced has come up more than a few times in hypnotherapy and NDE cases that I've looked into. So thank yeah. you for that. Yeah. Christian, and, I, you know, in all my experiences, I don't hear about a galactic council. I don't hear about some of this other stuff that people say. It's um, pretty plain and simple from, you know, it is what it is. And there's no frills or thrills about it. You know, it's, it just is what it is. <laughs> really quick, uh, I wanted to add, so Christian, and so Nancy, you said that you call them the elders, right? Yes. 
since my channeling uh, that happened back in fall time, mm -hmm. people were asking me, they're like, what are the entity group that like, what are like the top, like, what would you say that their name is? And I was like, the word that comes to mind is the elders. Um, I've never heard, heard of that. I know I haven't heard somebody else say that. So I was like, oh, yeah. wow. Okay. One thing that I'm here for, there is so much misinformation out there. People have tried to humor, humanize and change all, put all these dramatic things into it. And, you know, a lot of it's not true, you know? And so we've been lied to for so long. We truly need to know who we are, what our origins are, you know, what our capabilities are, because we have been dumbed down. They told me everything that we ever needed when we were created on this planet and this planet was formed, everything that we ever needed to survive was placed here. There's a cure for everything that we would, any disease, anything, there's a cure for everything. And that we can extend our lives and we can heal ourselves, but we have to have this, get away from this programming and we have to start thinking more positive and being better human beings. And we have to realize that our air has toxins, our water has toxins, our food has toxins. They give us uh, uh, synthetic drugs that our body was not designed to take. All these things have been done intentionally to keep us dumbed down and to keep us at a lower level of consciousness and to make us die at younger ages. So those things are going to change. They're going to change. And we're going to realize and outgrow, that we've outgrown it and they know, those ways no longer serve us. Our banking systems are breaking down. Our religious societies are breaking down. Our technology has become so great it's breaking everything down. So that's another thing that they explained to me is that AI technology is a man-made tool. And they told me, keep it as a man-made tool. It was created by us. We're intelligent. We're going to become more intelligent. We need to be in charge of it all. We do not let, need to let certain elite people operate it and only use it to benefit them. It needs to be used for all of humanity. And if we use it in the right way, it will change our lives so to the better. And eventually people will take a job as a hobby. It won't be like it is like living in a slave system now, paying taxes or anything like that. What the visions they showed me is that you will choose something that you truly love to do. And it won't matter what it pays or anything. It's something you love. And our lives will be happier and better and we'll live longer lives. And, you know, and we'll use AI technology to, you know, take care of a lot of things for us in a good way. There's a lot, it won't happen overnight. Nothing that happens overnight, but our world is changing and we have to change with it or we're going to wipe ourselves out. We can't do everything overnight, but we have to start somewhere. And it is the time to start. It's the time. Now, Nancy, I've seen a, a few of your interviews uh, where it came up where you were discussing the waves, the waves of humanity that have been um, coming down to earth, of course, since we're choosing, mm -hmm. our souls are choosing to, and they're choosing to come in waves. Could you go into more detail about that for our audience? I, I don't necessarily talk about that. I know that there was like, you know, you hear about like the indigos, you hear about like, well, basically what I know is that I am not the only incarnate that came here. From what I was told by the interdimensionals is that Every single race, because it's not just one race of beings that are sitting up there watching and waiting for us. It's many different ones. And each one of them have sent incarnates here. So I'm here representing the interdimensionals, but, you know, there's positive grays and they have their incarnates here and there's positive reptilians and they have theirs here. And, you know, so we were sent here because... They have me, when they used to come get me when I was little, they would change my frequency by using the device. As I've gotten older, they don't have to do that with me anymore. I am at a higher frequency and 
I have the ability, not that I don't like to even say this really, but I can change the atmosphere in a room. I can make people happier. I can create and generate positive energy around me. And the thing about it is what they told me and showed me is that when you raise your frequency and you become positive and you refuse to let negative energy influence you, the people around you will start doing the same thing because they like what you're doing and they sense the vibration and feeling off of you and it feels good. And it's like it will start. That's what's going to happen to our planet. The more of us that wake up and start raising our frequency, refusing to listen to the negative things about the world, raising our frequencies, and then it's going to expand and expand until it reaches all of us. Uh, when you mentioned it, and I agree with you entirely, the humanity is is enslaved. Yes. And it is. And so I, I've been pondering this, of course, for decades. Um, but who is it? Is it just purely put on humanity by ourselves? It's just one of those kind of questions, because it's like I, with my fiance, I was like, you know, there had to have been a point in time within human history where men and women were were equals and that's just like is that where it started you know we don't know we're just hypothesizing we're just thinking well, about it and it's just like what is it purely from our mindset that we are the way we are today or is there is there a like possibly a negative aspect that's been toying with us i mean it's just one of those weird questions that you know it's hard to find it's a group of elites that are really rich and a combination of Illuminati, dark government, they kind of all like have their own like little power club. And what they do is manipulate all of our people in government offices. They're like puppets. We're like puppets. So we're all manipulated. And so, yes, they have cures for cancer. Yes, they have cures for just for everything. But do they allow us to have access to it? No because they cannot make money off of intelligent, healthy people. Everything is done from greed. And so that's why when they found out that the interdimensionals and the positives were all here and putting in a frequency way, ray, uh, waves of love, energy, and unity, uh, pure love, all these things, they created that war in the Middle East you know, they're trying every little thing, you know, to try to create havoc and things and, and, have, and have, you know, of course, they don't want disclosure to happen because once people, when you open that can of worms, there's going to be so many questions because it's been 80 years of suppressed information, 80 years of some people coming up missing, 80 years of technology that could have saved a lot of lives. And that's a whole lot of explaining to do. So there's half that want to do the right thing, but then there's others that are influenced by these really rich people who don't, they want to, they're fighting tooth and nail to keep us like we are, but they can't do that. It, 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 I mean, I've already, it's going to happen. It, it's just a matter of time and there, it's over. Yeah. Uh, Nancy, as a former Department of Defense employee, uh, while you were working for the federal government uh, in this capacity, I wanted to ask, it's, it's a multifaceted question, I'll try to keep it simple, but during your time as a DOD employee, did you happen to come across um, any information in any of the programs that you've worked uh, with or any of the uh, colleagues that you've uh, been around in regards to the reality of the phenomena? And why do you believe the Department of, the, of Defense is wanting to keep disclosure under wraps. Um, you know, I'm also, I'm also reminded of uh, how in the past couple of years, you know, David Grush had his uh, whistleblower testimony in front of uh, Congress. I wanted to ask also, um, what do you think these agreements that David Grush and other government workers have alluded to with these NHI, um, what were these agreements about? Well, in my case, 
I think the interdimensionals wanted me to go to work there and they instigated it because I applied for the job and bam, I was sent to Schofield Barracks, Hawaii. How could you say no to that? (laughs) So I went and, and I went other places too, but I was in dentistry. So I had to have a security clearance, but that's because I worked with commanders uh, and generals and and high-ranking uh, officers, and we were basically an installation that were that was getting soldiers ready to deploy to Afghanistan. We had to have all the security clearances and have an understanding of security and all this kind of stuff. So it had nothing to do with extraterrestrials at all. It was purely just because of who I was working with and and being in the Pacific at a prime location. And as far as like Grush and those type guys, I do know that if you sign a contract with the government that you can go to jail uh, if you disclose um, information. So I I don't know. I think a lot of it is... uh, their, their hands are being tied, and that is because there is a group of elites that do not want this to happen. I wouldn't even say it was necessarily the Army. I'd say it goes further up. But I will say that some of the commanders and things, they want to put uh, nuclear weapons into space. You know, you have to understand some of the mentality of some of these uh, commanders and things uh General Patton comes to mind. So if you've got like these guys in there like that, you know, they can think of a thousand reasons why they should put a nuclear weapon up on the moon or somewhere. And I can tell you right now, extraterrestrials and interdimensionals will never let that happen. Never. Just to validate that for people that don't know, also, you already have two former captains who watched over our nuclear bases come out and say that they're lying and that these UFOs are sh- showing up and shutting down the bases. You have uh, Robert Salas, former Captain Robert Salas, and David Shinley testifying to the former members of Congress that they were uh, showing up. They didn't hurt anybody, but they shut down the bases, and they were forced to sign NDAs to not tell anybody about it. So that's yeah. for people that don't know. People in the United States in particular forget there's a lot of indigenous people still on our planet. And the interdimensionals had my son and I go to Mexico and go three hours up a mountain to this very primitive area to see some Zapotec uh, tribe. And they uh, were very primitive, but they were very eco-friendly. But you know, there's a lot of indigenous people that have no clue about what's even going on in the world. So there's so many reasons why the interdimensionals and extraterrestrials want to keep our planet safe. And we think it's everything's all about us. This is not about us. This is not about me. This is not about the United States. This is a worldwide phenomenon. And there's people all over the planet that they care about and they don't, they're innocent bystanders to all this technology and stuff. They don't have a clue. So not to mention every microorganism, every animal, everything, every plant species, everything, our reefs, our coral, everything, extraterrestrials, interdimensionals, they love it all. They love it all. And we forget. We just think, you know, we, we think that everything's about us, and it's not. Are you able to describe telepathy and your psychic interactions with these entities? Yes. Um, about two, a little over two years ago, uh, I woke up in the middle of the night, and my body jerked up forward, and they gave me a Kundalini awakening, and I had no clue what was going on, but my body jilted up forward and my head was, I was kind of like this. And they did a power surge that went all the way through my head, all the way down to the base of my trunk and went all the way back up. Then I went back down on my back again. And then it pulled me back up and it did that like three different times of surges. And then I had strange experience afterwards. I think 
I ended up like at a, a meeting, apparently it was a meeting that other people had just had that happen to. And I was so disoriented that I can't say that I really got a lot out of that because I, I didn't know what a Kundalini awakening was. I, I didn't even tell anybody about it for a couple of months because I wasn't sure what it was. But anyway, I do know now what they were doing. They had always, when I would ask them questions, they would always say, you already know. And I would say, no, I don't. But I did, but I was questioning it. We question everything, you know. That's just a part of our human ways. But when they gave me the Kundalini awakening, what that did was it opened my subconscious up into my human consciousness. And then a lot of my memories flowed in and gave me, it was just there. And it, so I quit questioning it as much. It, it, I just knew it. But as far as like when they come down to get me, the, the female hybrid, when she communicates with me telepathically, there is no inflection in her, we'll call it voice, or we'll call, it's not a voice. Well, it's a voice in my head, but in her command or in her statement, there is no inflection. And I can't distinguish between male and female from her. However, I know she's a female. I just know it. We, I just telepathically know that. And I know that uh, I'm bonded to her since birth. But when I get on craft and they start communicating with me, I hear them telepathically, but I hear them as male or female and I can sense inflection in their voice. Say, for example, if they're kind of like making a slight joke or if they're being stern, you know, I can sense inflection and I can distinguish between male and female. But on the hybrids, I have a problem. You know, it just sounds... It, sound, it doesn't really sound like anything other than a sound, but it, there's no male or female sound to it. Would you be able to go into a little bit more detail about the mother or the, the um, that you're, you're connected with? Is um, I sometimes refer to her as an extraterrestrial mom because I do know that she is a guardian and she escorts me everywhere I go and she does, she gets me to wherever I need to go, gets me back home in the bed. I have a very loving bond with her. And when I was in Mexico, it was like they, I woke up and they were there and she got me up and we were standing on the floor and, and we were like just playing with each other's fingers, you know, just, and we were just like, you know, and I would touch her and she didn't care. She would let me touch her. And and I, I felt a great love from her. And my feelings towards her was of great love. And I know that I've been with her all my life. The other two with her, I couldn't tell. I, I, I don't, I'm not bonded with them at all. It's just her. I wanted to ask, because um, I've heard you bring this up in podcasts before, um, and it's kind of like a sort of a two-part question, but kind of the same thing. Um, and this is my understanding and belief as well, that I feel, I don't know, something in me just feels like the powers that were, that's what I like to call them, so kind of manifest that. But the powers that were, I feel like they were told a deadline of some kind. And it seems, it's weird, it's like things are happening behind the scenes to kind of uh, show that in a way. Like we're hearing yes. about all this now and it's escalating. And... There are some people who are mentioning um, in the spiritual community, mediums, channelers, some people are mentioning around the time frame of 2026, 2027, whether that's disclosure or whether that's something else that's important, um, I don't know. Um, but what, if they told you anything, what makes you believe that uh, we were given a, a deadline of sorts? Well, I know that our government knows they are here and they are not hiding from us. Right. Uh, we live in a 3D world and our eyes can only see what's available in our 3D world. So they're everywhere in our skies um, through a night vision with infrared light. A lot of people can see, um, see them up yeah. in the sky everywhere. See them, uh, yeah. and, and I can see them, you know, I've always been able to see them, but I'm at a higher frequency, which means my awareness is wider 
and more open. And we're going to all start getting more that way like, gradually, you know. Like uh, like people see, like how you have one person who can see auras and another person can't see auras. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. So I know that they've always known this was going to happen. But I'll tell you one thing that I think one reason why I think the government is slacking off is that they don't want to necessarily be the ones to jump out there first. One, they would be exposing what they know to every other country in the world. Two, yeah. uh, they might have to expose some of the technology that they've been sitting on, which Really and truly, they with a war going on, they don't really want to do that either. And the other thing is that with the James Webb Telescope, I think they're just waiting for that thing to say, we found life. We found life. And they're going to let the James Webb Telescope and NASA come out and say, life has been found. It's blah, 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 so many million years away. And all of humanity is going to be excited and, and, and happy with that because it, it's not like right here around our planet. You're, like a and, soft disclosure. Yeah. So I think they're waiting for that. And then they're hoping that maybe some of these other big questions like about JFK, technology, uh, you know, all these different things, a thousand questions people are going to want to know. Uh, they're hoping that some of that maybe is going to slide under the, the coattail of that. But I don't see how it possibly can, but I think they're just putting it off as long as possible. There's a lot of reasons. There's It's a cornucopia of reasons why oh, they've yeah. been holding back. You know, number one that I can usually start thinking of right away is that they would have to admit that uh, we don't have control of our skies. Exactly. You know, that's the big thing is like, hey, you know, we're uh, we're here to protect you. We've got you guys covered. You're completely protected. Nothing to see here. Nothing can come through. If they're like, well, you know, we've got interdimensional craft that's coming from who knows where, whether it be 60 billion light years away or just the next galaxy over or just the next star system over. It, that's just too much. You yes. know, that'd be like because we we can't do anything about it. So when you saw, like, I'm sure you saw the uh, jellyfish UAP that Corbell put out. Right. You know, I was looking on social media and people are like freaking out because they're going, yeah. oh my gosh, these things could be flying over my head all the time. And to which me and my fiance were like, yeah, okay. I mean, well, obviously they haven't done any harm to me yet. So why would they start doing it now? And it's just one of those things where it's like, okay, we, we're comfortable that there's other dimensions and there's other densities. And, um, you know, uh, there's things in the sky, there's things in the ground, there's things everywhere. And we just go about our lives. There's not much I can do about it right now anyway, right? I think the best thing we can do, I don't know if this is a question as much as a statement, is to um, to get humanity on board, right? Whether exactly. We, Try to be chosen. better humans and we'll come together as one. And, yes. You know, come together, work together, stick together. Yeah. Yes. And, and I mean, we are one already, again, um, no pun on my my uh, TikTok channel, but we are one, and that's that doesn't mean that you never you know disagree with with each other. No, you, I disagree with myself all the time, you know, yeah. as far as what decisions I make. So there's there's no right or wrong. Like oh, you know, uh, if we're all conscious, how come that guy over there is doing those bad things to those people? You know, it's, well, it's all perspective. So, um, but it's just there's that. Going back to, I guess, the, the enslavement part, and one of the biggest things that I've found out is, is just that um, fear is such, such a powerful emotion, uh, if not it weapon, is. It, and that is know, used. Once you experience fear, all perception of what's happening around you is distorted big time because that, that just changes everything. But uh, another thing I wanted to say to y'all is that the government made deals with some of those lower rim extraterrestrials. They are not warlike. They are not demonic. But they were considered a rogue race, races that left the collective consciousness of the positives and came down here on their own. And I know like the, the greys, they were all genetic scientists. Uh, most grays, everyone in a 
clan or, or, or a group, they all do the same type of function or job. They were all genetic scientists, so they were wanting to do genetic research. So what happened was is that there was agreements in a trade of technology of some sort, but the grays only care about, they were task-oriented. They had no regard to what anybody thought. They were, in their eyes, they were not doing anything wrong. And then really, if you think about it, it's no different than us going out and tagging our wildlife. They overstepped their boundaries and broke the cosmic law. So that's why they were isolated and excommunicated from the other collective consciousness of the rest of all the extraterrestrials. But the thing is, is that the government thought that they would stick stick to like whatever the original treaty or trade was, but they did their own thing. So now the government simply doesn't know who to trust. <laughs> well, they can't trust themselves. Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, right. yeah. At yeah. first of all, they were messing with the wrong ones. Now, the way I understand it is that because of bad decisions in the past, the positive and interdimensionals, they're working towards, they're working on humanity. They're not going to down to government. They're not going to ever land at the White House or anything. You mentioned earlier um, about how these beings have the capability of altering our perception, influencing our consciousness, you know, making a making an encounter pleasant, right? Um, if, if I were to look uh, back in the historical antiquity, and, you know, th there are many, many cases of instances where the supernatural or interdimensional or extraterrestrial beings, um, you know, they weren't so righteous in their interactions with people at times, right? I'm also reminded of, you know, the Colaris incident in uh, South America in the 70s where a bunch of villagers were attacked and stuff. And, you know, you mentioned not only are there a cadre of higher dimensional beings that are benevolent, but there are also perhaps lower vibrational entities, right? <clears throat> now, when it, comes to, when it comes to experiencers and, you know, people that can communicate with these beings, both good and bad, how are we able to discern or, or have the ability to determine? For me, it is face-to-face -face physical. I am eyeballing and I'm interacting physically, you know, so I know who I'm talking to. You're just hearing it. How do you not know? How do you know if it's a spirit? How do you not know it's a ghost or a spirit be being trying to pretend to be an extraterrestrial? You have to somehow or another... Ask them, prove to me who you are. Done that. That's what I would do. I would say, prove to me who you are. You know, something like that. For me, like I wanted to, for the interdimensionals, I wanted to, they say that they know everything I do. They say that they're here even when I don't know that they're here. And I said, I, I, I don't have any proof of that. So they started doing things. And they would, for example, they would take the clock. They were not, I could not see them, but they would take the clock in front of me and run it around to four o'clock, four o'clock, four o'clock. And this was a battery operated wall mounted clock. So it wasn't that the power was going off and doing weird things or anything. They were doing it. And, you know, so they've done things like that to prove to me that, I'm in a 3D world and they could be here parked in, the extra, in their spacecraft. And with my human eyes, I would not be able to see it unless they wanted me to see it, you know, because they can be invisible and they can be, you know, they, they can do both ways. So for me, if you're channeling somebody or, or my question is, how do you know who you're talking to? Because from what I was told that, if a human being was a very playful or a very trickster type person, they'll be that way in spirit world too. So they think it's funny, but I'm just saying it could happen. How is a regular person able to discern as to whether, say, an influential uh, personality 
Well, I'm figuring it out, unfortunately, by doing what I'm doing because I sit there and listen to a lot of stuff. And, you know, I guess it's kind of like what I've always been told growing up. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. You have to understand, we have been manipulated and people have figured out that there's a market in this business. There's a market. And not just with the extraterrestrials, but even in your paranormal stuff. I mean, people can pull a hoax, you know, and make it look like something. So we all have, I think it's good for us all to ask questions and do our homework and research because unfortunately there is people out there trying to make money off of this. For example, I called, I won't say who, but I called one place to see about um, being a speaker and point blank, he asked me how many followers I have and if I, how many I could pay for, or, or how many would pay to come. You know, it was all about money, money, money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I'm like, well, I thought this was a humanity thing to help the world, you know. And my pocketbook. Yeah. But it's, yeah. It's, a lot of people's in it for the pocketbook. And, you know, it's unfortunate. But it is what it is. But, it, you know, every field has this problem. So mm -hmm. it's true. But and I will say I, I don't make any money off of doing this stuff. However, at some point I will I've been influenced to write a book and I was told nobody ever becomes a millionaire writing a book. So we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> but the, the part that I like about it is if I can afford to put it in different languages and it would reach the world, you know, get a message out across the world. And plus, if anything, the only thing I really want is for someday for my grandchildren and my grandchildren's children to say, my grandmother, Nancy, made a difference for humanity. Thank you, Nancy. That's, that's all I want is the legacy. You know, I don't care about selling T-shirts, hats, and thermoses. You know what I mean? So, and I see that a lot, and it bothers me, but it is what it is. And, you know, I've got to get my message out there, but that doesn't mean I have to behave like some of the other people. You know? When we first uh, started this channel, Cosmic Convergence, I, 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 I immediately pondered um, why, why am I doing it? And it's for the message. It's, yeah. you know, I mean, the, the, the subscriptions will come, some will go, but they'll come, other things will come. And as long as I'm, you know, I'm not starving on the street, you know, then, then that's okay. But it's about the message. It's exactly, that's, that's the, that's the you, reasoning. You know, and I find by, by letting things happen organically, naturally, more doors open up for me that way than, um, uh, lying about things. I mean, you know, like I'm never going to be claiming to have flown a UFO. I'm never going to be saying that I can do this, I can do that, because that would be a lie. I, and that's the one thing that the interdimensionals have done with me and my two sons. I am a hands-on, I like to learn, I learn things by hands-on, by experience. It. So I think that's one reason why they have instigated me living all these different places so that I can meet different indigenous people, learn about different cultures and experience things hands on because I'm the kind of person that I have to feel comfortable in my own shoes to be able to, to be able to feel like I'm truthful, honest, and the best of my ability getting my points across. You know, I would never be able to sleep at night if I sit here and lied and made up a story. I wouldn't. That's just me. Leading into this, I'd really like you to go into some of the details of traveling with these uh, entities and encountering these different races and kind of some of the um, adventures you kind of went on. But one particular detail that I thought was really interesting was you had uh, talked about in one instance that you, you saw an aquatic being yes. and he yes. was kind of cranky, which I thought that detail was so funny. And yeah. I was like, wait, this is... This is, the, if she was just making up a story, there would be like, oh yeah, everyone's just really nice, but this particular entity was like, eh, he, I don't want to deal with you. And I thought that was such an interesting yeah. detail. So I, I would really love you to go into more detail of uh, that experience. Yeah. So the Greys came to get me and took me to a craft. And when I got on craft, there were human beings and there was a female there and I sat by her, she was a human being. 
uh, about the same age as me, maybe younger, but um, I was fully conscious. And I asked her if she knew what was going on or and if she had been on this particular craft before. And yes, she had. And what we were, I was with a group of explorers. And what it was, and I didn't even know what the word cryptid was back then, but basically what it was is there were uh, tall grays, there was aquatic beings, and there were uh, Nordics or, or Palladian. Like I said, I don't ask, what are you? You know, I, I don't do that. I mean, and I don't ask names or anything like that. And everything's done telepathic, and you, I don't know. I'm more in awe of what all, and taking everything in. I don't think about all these little writing down. You know, I don't do that. So anyway, so there's all these beings, and they had, like, what their version of what looked like computer screens and things. And they were getting um, like heat sensor things would start lighting up and you could see it moving around on the screen. And what it was is they were picking up on and what they were doing were looking for creatures that were either jumped over to our dimension or a tear in a timeline or something of this nature. They were in a place and creating habit. And so their whole job was to go and collect these beings, creatures, collect them and then take them back to where they belong because they were causing people to be scared and creating habit. So, and that's how I met the aquatic being. And when I saw him, I walked up and sit down beside him and he, I said, you know, tried to talk to him. I said, hello. And ask him what you know what he was preparing for, and he just really did not want to talk to me at all. And he really wouldn't even make eye contact with me. Why I don't know, but I sat there for a few minutes, and I I realized that you know he just really didn't want to have interaction with me. But you know a lot of them are very task oriented. They're they don't have the emotions like we have. They don't. They're not as they're social, but not as social as us. There's no nonsense, I guess would be the better way of putting it. There's just no nonsense, you know. And so I got up and left eventually. But yeah, he just, he, he didn't, he didn't, he was busy. He never stopped doing what he was doing or anything, you know. But it was pretty interesting because I could see like these, it was a cat looking like creature that they were going after. And they went and got it. I didn't go with them. I was stayed on craft, but they got it. And then they loaded it up. And then we left and took it to where it was supposed to, where it come from. And it was this location that you guys went and got that cryptid, was this on Earth or was this a different planet? It was on Earth. Yeah. Okay. So I've been in USOs under the water and things like that. And, and it's, for me, it was a very cold place. It's cold cold water so but I've lived close to uh I lived a little while in New Zealand and uh Australia I lived a long time in Australia so I was pretty close to the I guess the South Pole there and so it could have easily been somewhere like that because it was a lot of I could see ice and things like that but it could have been anywhere really but even before that all became popular I remember that even as a child going on board and seeing realizing that I was going up we were going underwater and the, i even had an experience where they were training me they put me in like these tube like uh, a big tank and it was a clear tank and it was kind of a bluish gel and they had uh, like a uh, thing around my waist and it was keeping up with bottles or, or whatever they were doing but and they were teaching me to breathe uh, it was kind of like the show abyss where the guy in his helmet fills up with a fluid and they were teaching me to be able to breathe. And I don't know why they were doing that. Um, like uh, liquid oxygen it. kind of. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, I don't know if we were like maybe going somewhere and I needed that or if it was a training, I don't know. Was this before kind of, all of the ufology lore was out or was this kind of in the mist? Would you, would you have these experiences? It was, it was all like, oh, that's Most of this stuff happened before because this started happening all my life. Um, you know, I, I was, I grew up as an outdoors child, big into camping, big into staying in national parks, state parks and 
a lot of hiking and canoeing and all this kind of stuff. So a lot of things happened while on um, vacations and, and trips like that because we were in pretty isolated, uh, you know, easy to get to places and, you know, kind of off the tour. We weren't staying at any of the tourist trap places or anything like that, heavily populated. So a lot of it happened before. But when I got into my 20s, I started... Um, I started to get a few books and the main books that I got, I was more curious and read about the Anunnaki, a lot about them and stuff. But uh, most of my experiences are, my experiences are with the gray uh, humanoid looking, either Nordics or whatever they are. They could be Anunnaki, but they've never said they're Anunnaki. So, you know, I, I'm always fond of asking um, various experiencers and, uh, you know, people that, uh, you know, I come across in terms of the notion of soul contract. And uh, at the start of the interview, you mentioned that soul contracts are sort of like an agreement prior to reincarnating or incarnating into this 3D realm that we're supposed to learn certain lessons. My question is in regards to soul contracts. Now, some of the critique with soul contracts is that it could be seen as a form of, of victim blaming that we are destined to experience all kinds of trauma, all kinds of horrible things because it's a lesson that we need to learn in this life because we didn't get that lesson in our previous incarnation. <clears throat> what is the danger of this notion of soul contract? Um, you know, for instance, like, I think of children who are born into unfortunate situations where yeah. they're traumatized or abused and all kinds of horrible things happen. How are we able to justify this notion of soul contracts? To me, it seems like a, a form of, of victim blaming. Is, is, is that a form of spiritual bypassing in a way? I think it's just like everything else. A lot of the things that we've been told are from a human perspective, and it was designed to sell a book. It was designed to sell you something. It wasn't for your best interest or the truth of the matter. I think the simple question is a lot of it we do not know. I, for example, in November on Thanksgiving Day, I lost my 29-year-old daughter-in-law died and she has a three-year-old and a six-year-old. And with a heavy heart and, you know, I, I why? Why take a beautiful 29-year-old that's a mother? You know, we have to learn to forgive the universe for whatever reason that they take our loved ones. We do make soul contracts. And I've listened to a lot of people talk about these things. And I know that I've been told. And sometimes in a soul contract, person makes decision that they're going to leave this world. And within 29 years, I'm going to have two kids. That's hard for the human side of me to understand. It is because I look at my grandchildren and I'm like, that's not fair. But that is looking at it from my perspective, which that's being selfish because what that person agreed upon, that's their business, you know. So there, a lot of these things, I don't think we'll totally ever totally understand until we get up there. But I know that my soul contract is that I came here from being an interdimensional. And I know that they live much longer lives than what a human lives and that my family is still alive up there. And when I go on craft, I have a group of peers always watching me. And I know it's my family. And I purposely try not to make eye contact with them because I am a mother, I am a grandmother, and I love my family here, but I know that I love them up there. I don't want all that to come flooding in because I'm not finished here yet. I'm not finished. And I, I love my grandchildren and my family. And it was wild for me to even understand and figure out that, you know, I grew up, this was it. There was nothing else. I'm a human being. This is it, you know, and then now I've learned about all these other things, but I still have to balance my life here. You know, I have to be able to balance and continue being the Nancy that I am here on earth, but I'm also 
a Nancy up there somewhere or some another name. Or think about this. They live such long lives. I could be in a sleep stasis in a up there. And this could be a dream world. 63 years seems like a long time to me. There is no such thing as time to them. So I could be in a dream state. And so when this is over, I might just simply wake up and go, wow, what a dream. I, I, I like that. Know. I like that reframe. <clears throat> and because I don't know, I don't know everything. And I'm not going to pretend okay. to know everything. We will never know everything, you know? I I like that. And because you're becoming more influential with respect to your message and um, these these revelations that have been bestowed upon you by these interdimensionals. Yeah. If you can engage in this thought experiment with me for a bit. Yes. If someone were to come to you, say, maybe at a conference or maybe they wanted to consult with you online and, you know, they say, hey, I was abducted by these aliens and it was such a traumatic, horrible experience. You know, I, I was taken against my will, you know, against my, my agency. I was subjected to all kinds of unspeakable probing, for instance. And, you know, they took my DNA. I was impregnated. They took my baby from me. How, how are you going to frame that with the notion of, of soul contract? Because I would imagine that if someone were to be in an influential position and they ascribe to this soul contract kind of perspective, how comfortable would you be saying that? I would say- It's a soul contract. You signed up for this and this is what well, was supposed to happen to you. I do know that some of those extraterrestrials that came here and did some of that overstep our free will. Okay. So they didn't have an agreement for that. So that's why they were excommunicated because they overstepped that. The positive in the interdimensionals, if I were to say, I do not want to partake in this, they would honor what I say and they would not do it. These other guys, they only cared about what their agenda was and overstepped their boundaries. So first of all, I would want to know how, how old were you, or I want to know, when did this happen to you? How often did this happen? And a lot of times you'll find out on an abduction, it was a one-time event sometimes. Sometimes some of these women say it was multiple times. So in that case, they may have had an agreement. You know, I guess it depends on the person on whether I could tell them what I know. But I know that if they had a child and they have their child, their child is better off being on craft with them than it would ever be down here. The government would take it or either people would be ugly to it and it probably wouldn't be able to survive in this environment. So, and I do understand where maybe if that is truly what happened, they might, they would want to come back and get that mother to come and have contact with that half human child so that they would have know their identity, their heritage. and, and There have, are cases of that. And have a yeah. bond with them. I admire them for that. So they don't have to do that. But it sounds like to me that that's what they're doing. And that's why I think a lot of times it's simply been misunderstood. They are treating us like we do an animal, I guess. You know, like think about when you breed dogs or whatever and then you at times you'll take the children away and then at times you may introduce them back or, or you know what I'm saying we have to understand they are billions of years ahead of us and in their eyes they really they did not think they were doing anything wrong and they will not be punished for doing that it was not good it was not a, a right thing and it did break the cosmic law but they really did not kill anybody. <laughs> and, and, and I've met Travis Walton. Travis Walton, they made a movie about him, Fire in the Sky. And when he signed over his rights to the movie, everything in that whole story changed. It was over-dramatized and made scary to sell box seats. Yes, 
he was traumatized and very scared because there's no way a human can understand these things. But now when you talk to him, and he's older than I am, he'll tell you that his perception of the whole thing is quite different. They saved his life. They could have left him there on the ground, but they did not. They took him on crap and they cured him for radiation poisoning or some type of toxic poisoning. He was at the wrong place at the wrong time. And then rather than take him back to where they found him, which he may or may not been found in the woods, they took him to a populated area and left him where he would be found. Yeah, his story is his story is fascinating. Yeah, I have you know so, I've grown up with that you know with that story when it first broke, and it's uh, yeah it's again showing my age, but yeah, I mean what a what an outstanding gentleman. And, yeah, you know, so I, I, mean, I know him, and I also know his uh, brother-in-law, the driver, too. Wow. That was the driver and left him there. You know, <laughs> ran off and left him, and then came back looking for him. I, I know him too, so. You know, as we age and as we calm down, our perception changes. And I think that, you know, if I was talking to somebody, I would listen to what they said and then I would tell them an extraterrestrial's perception of how they would see it. And then maybe it would make a difference to them, like, and their minds would change, like Travis's has, even Whitley Strivers. Uh, opinions have changed over the years too. You mentioned uh, before that um, something to the degree that like a lot of it is misunderstood. So, and in my, in my own personal research, I've come across hypnotherapy cases that to the persons like on the surface level, it was very terrifying. They did all these sure. things, but you know, like you said, the fear kind of takes control and then you think all kinds of things, oh, this is a demon, oh, this is, this is happening, this is bad. Um, because you don't like it. But then when the person gets regressed and, you know, the hypnotherapist helps take the fear away, yeah. they're more uh, willing to observe, like, whatever was happening. And they're like, oh, it's not as bad as I thought it was actually. And there yeah. are a bunch of yeah. cases that come across like that. One thing I know for a fact, and I've done this to me, and I, I don't know if I mentioned it or not, but when I start having that fear sensation come over me and, and sense anxiety, she will, the female, she'll touch me on the forehead and she'll put me in a sedated state. It's like a, a mellowed out Nancy state where I'm fully functional. I lose all of the, the fear. I lose all the emotions and stuff. And, and when I come back and she puts me in bed, my memories are fragmented. So most of the time, they're scared at first, but then they tap them out because they're not going to physically fight a human being. That's why they come in threes, I think. You know, they come prepared to watch out for each other. And they'll immediately, because they put me in a sleep paralysis, just coming like that. And so when they were sitting there getting my kids and stuff, I was fully conscious and saw the whole thing, but I could not move. I could not say a word or anything. So... They have, they have the ability to do that, and it's at their best interest to do that for their own safety. So that's why all this probing and the things coming in through the eye, those things don't really happen. You have to understand they're billions of years ahead of us. Why would they come all the way down here to poke you in the eye and look up your rump? That's, that's not the case. And also, that's I don't true. believe that they're the ones doing the cattle mutilations either because they are all vegans. They don't, they would not touch because of all the toxins in our food, in our water, in our air. They don't even like our air. They don't like our food. They don't like our water. There's nothing from, a, they don't eat things like that. The grays make a paste. They make a paste from nutrients and they rub it into their skin and it's absorbed through their skin and the, they excrete it out through their skin. So they don't go to the bathroom or eat like we do. The humanoids rarely eat. Eating is not like humans. For us, it's a grand event. We eat three times a day and snack. They may eat once a week and it's purely a nutrient. You know, it, it's the science. They, they're with the science of it where we're in the glory of it. You know, it's totally different. So, 
and they don't sleep like we sleep. You know, we, we sleep long periods of time. They don't need as much sleep and they can go several days without sleep. But when it's time, then they turn themselves down and rest and they'll eat only when their body needs nutrients. And they call, it's, it's considered, it's all nutrient based. It's, they don't have ice cream or pizza or, you know, it's all a nutrient and it's for energy and nutrients. I've heard of that, which is interesting. Yes. It's cool to hear that from you. Yes. Well, and I wanted to also bring up like, again, with your point, George, with kind of having people having these um, visceral reactions to these experiences. I just wanted to briefly. So um, when I had realized the owl in the tree memory was a cover memory, I had a, um, Mm -hmm. I was at work, I was walking and I was like, gee, I wonder if that's a cover memory because I was in the middle of reading um, Communion, fantastic book. And, uh, you know, just thinking about it, I was like, oh, yeah, I wonder, okay, whatever, go back to work. Hour later, I start having PTSD episode where I'm like shaking. I was like cold sweats. I wanted to cry. I wanted to get like leave or get under my table. Like it was a very like visceral reaction. And I'm like, what's going on? I was having a physical reaction to something. And then I realized like, wait, an hour ago, I had this thought of like, gee, I wonder if that core memory in my childhood was something else. And I had to work through that. I think owls are very significant. Mm-hmm. When I lived, when I first lived here in Mississippi, um, a white owl lived under my porch for years and I associated it with him being a watcher. And now where I live now, there's an owl out here and I hear it all the time. I hear it all the time. So. I don't know. I, I know that there's something to do with, you know, I don't know what it is, but, you know, it, it, there's something to it, though. There's something significant. And I, I don't I think it's more than just a, it, it could be a screen memory, but I also think it could be like a watcher as well. Kind of My the basis of the spirit animals, really, yeah. think about it. That was an experience that I had to work through the fear of that visual reaction of that but then later, as I worked through that, I was able to realize, yeah. oh, this wasn't a negative experience. This was just my psyche trying to protect me. So I yeah. think it depends on the, you know, it depends on the circumstance. But like, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it, it, they're there. it's there for a reason. It's a reminder to you. There's something they want you to remember, I would say. And it probably wasn't bad, but you've got to get over that fear. Probably you know, wasn't they, bad, but if, if they wanted you to remember the encounter or the experience, then why would your memory be wiped or fragmented? Because because of your mental state at the time. We have emotions that they do not have. They do not have emotions. We are the most emotional beings in the whole universe and other universes. We are, and we have the shortest lifespan and we're very emotional. So they're telepathic. So when they walk in, and here's Nancy, and Nancy gets scared. Nancy starts heart pounding and all this stuff. They don't experience that. But whatever I feel, they feel tenfold times they don't like that feeling. That's why they tap us out immediately or anybody because they don't understand these feelings and they don't experience it and they don't like to experience it. And when they tap you out, it's like you're, you're fully, you're not, well, you're conscious, but it's fragmented type memories because it's like you're in a altered state. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Without, like the it's like a medicated state without the medication. They just somehow do it that way. I liken it to more like, um, you know, someone in a wildlife reserve wants to check on the health, the general healthy welfare of a spotted leopard, okay? They're not gonna go out there and just try to approach the spotted leopard and say, you know, nice kitty. What they're gonna do is they're gonna kind of put it to a relaxing state, then check on nice kitty. Because if they don't, they're gonna be shredded wheat. Exactly. And is because we are still very primitive. And we're very very aggressive. And we're very aggressive. That's why Travis Walton woke up on the craft swinging. 
yes. because <laughs> he was in the fight or flight mode. Yeah. I don't believe that that they expected for him to regain consciousness, but he did. And it's like uh, Whitley Strieber, you know, he was when he was first having contact made. Mm -hmm. Yes, he was put into paralysis because, man, this is a this is a human. You don't. I mean, we see what they're capable of. Oh, and yeah. We don't want to get harmed. Right. Yeah. It makes sense and, to and me. Or else you're going to have a lot of dentists that are trying to work on tiger's teeth all the time. There's exactly. always going to be job openings. Right. Yeah. So exactly. uh, no one's going to sign up for that. Yeah, <laughs> that's the way I look at. It. But from the tiger's perspective, hey, what is this human coming and doing to me? Right. Exactly. They may not understand. Right. And so a lot of these are just the sh whole shock value. Like my fiance and I, we talk to each other. It's like, you know, because the entity group that we're in contact with, she's seen some of them coming into the third, the third density from the fourth, mm -hmm. and um, they've told us this. Um, I know that sounds crazy to some, but no, I don't care. <laughs> and um, and uh, we say, well, you know, and I have told them, it doesn't matter what you look like to my human eyes. You are beautiful, right? Yes. But, we, but we'll talk about it. What if, what if, you know, what if Mickey Mouse, okay, just came around the corner, not saying it's the entity group. Let's just say Mickey Mouse comes around the corner and he's like, oh, hi. You're going to go, why? You're going to freak out because he came around from the corner and introduced himself, right? Yeah. Harmless Mickey Mouse, you know, but if you just come around the corner and say hello, you're going to flip out. So yeah. even if the, the most kind entity that wants to make initial contact with you isn't just going to show up, it's going to be through a long period of time, of little breadcrumbs. But if they finally do introduce themselves to you, they want to make sure that they ensure their own safety as well. That's how I look exactly. at it. That's right. Now, yeah, now the exactly negatives. Good. Now, negatives. I have had contact with negatives, and they've um, they, they've got their ways. I'm not saying that they're all negative. I'm not saying they're all yeah. positive. In my world, there's a duality. The universe is very dual. Yeah, they try. All of them have a different bedside manner, just like Correct. doctors. Yeah, yeah. Correct. So yeah. Um, you yeah. feel the difference. You, yeah, you know that's what I was going to get to. We know, and this is our symbol for knowing, right, which is interesting. We know the difference because I felt the love course through my body yeah. on a loving being, which I'm, I would love to, to hear any examples where you felt this, like this love that just transcends human love, like the true death. Yes. It's, you can't come up with a word for it. There's not and then I've, <laughs> there isn't. And then I felt such fear that I didn't think that I could that I've ever felt before through an experience, whether that was negative or positive. So I can see both, but I'm able to tell, I'm able to feel within my core, within my soul, right. what the difference is. Yeah. Now, some may not be able to do that, but myself personally, I know that, that I can, my fiance can. Could you describe a love or try to with human words? Because it's, it's, it's almost impossible to do so. That it you is one of these. euphoric feeling. It is euphoric it's like this love warmth. It's like it exuberates through you. It's a frequency, a vibrational frequency, and it's just overwhelming. Just, it's almost yeah. It's 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 almost like an aphrodisiac. It's, it feels good. I mean, it's a, a loving, good feeling, and you almost you want to cry because it's just nothing like you've ever felt in your whole life. You know, it's 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 incredible. It really is. That's why I have a deep, deep connection with them. And when I get to have my conscious time with them, and I'm able to touch and and whatever, I absorb it and relish in it because I realize how lucky I am. I mean, I realize that not everybody gets to experience that, but I also know that it's taken me. 63 years and I've had to earn their trust and you know because it was not easy for me I've had you know 20 years ago if you asked me about this I probably would have just laughed at you and said this is not fun because there was times it, you know I wished it wasn't happening to me but now that I understand and know what I know and the fact that I realized that they have been patient and I realized that they could have taken my children and me never even have known, but they let me be a part of that experience. So everything changes as you 
grow into this, your perce- you know, your perception of it. You, it's, it's just, it takes time. But I'm happier than I've ever been in my whole life. And I know who I am. I know my reason for being here on earth. I know when this life is over that where I'm going and it's all beautiful. And I want to enjoy the time that I have here and I will enjoy it more. And I will take better care of my body and better care of my family and be a better person because of them. Uh, where can people find you? Well, where can people um, get connected with you? Yeah, my website is timefordisclosure.com. And then my Facebook group is Time for Disclosure slash We Have Never Been Alone slash We Are the Disclosure. And I belong to a lot of groups and they're all great. Everybody kind of pulls together and we kind of all cooperate with each other. So um, it's a good place to get information about sources where you can have go to meetups or conferences or simply have interaction with like-minded people. Uh, all of us try to keep trolls out of the room. Uh, you know, we're really always on guard for that, for things like that. We have sources for the mental health people that are interested in this field and specialize in experiencers. So we have a lot of uh, groups that work together uh, and we all pretty much trade out information. So it's, it's really nice. Get your book out, uh, you know, within like a year from now, just putting it out there. So... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll definitely be uh, sharing it with everyone and stuff. And, and thank awesome. you so much again, Nancy, for coming on the podcast. Thank you, and thank you for having me. People like you make a difference and gives me the opportunity to put my, to do my mission and to help humanity. And that's what's important to me. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You so much. Thank, you. Yeah. thank you, Nancy. Aloha. Aloha.